This event is part of the Voices for the Future project, funded by the National Lottery through the Arts Council of England. and the Marcus Trust. Voices for the Future seeks to discover, honour and promote female voices past and present and to inspire, guide and build diverse voices for the future. Tonight's voice is that of Mary Anning. Around 1400 years ago, a Christian monastery was founded high up on the cliffs at Whitby. The first abbess was St Hild, or Hilda, who was renowned for her wisdom as well as for her virtue. She played a major role in converting England to Christianity. And when she died, the bells began ringing in the monastery nearby at Hackness, and a nun saw her being carried up to heaven by angels. <laughs> Custodia, 
before the ending of the day, Creator of the world, we pray that thou with wonted love wouldst keep thy watch around us while we sleep. The night is come like to the day, depart not thou by love away. Let not my sins, black as the night, eclipse the lustre of thy light. O thou whose nature cannot sleep upon my temples, sentry keep, make my sleep a holy trant while I rest my soul. She was made a saint because she performed several miracles as if she had supernatural powers. She also solved Whitby's great mystery, identifying the spiral stones buried in the cliffs and lying along the beach, now called Ammonites. They were easy to find, but what were they? According to the Bible, God originally created the world just as it is now. But why would you have made Ammonites? They have no obvious use. The answer lay in one of the builder's miracles. When Whitby was overrun by a plague of snakes, she flung them down from the cliff top and turned them into fossils. In tribute to her, the scientific name for snake stones is Hildoceros. A thousand years later, the problem remained unsolved. And from receiving credit for their work, as St Hilda had done, many women found their talents subsumed by their male relatives. However, the Henry Law's second book of airs and dialogues published in 1655, a volume known to have been in the possession of Samuel Pepys, gives a heartfelt tribute to Lady Mary Deering, describing her as an excellent performer and a good composer. But when you look at the index, her works are listed as her husband's, who did in all fairness provide the words, and it is not without difficulty to discover her musical compositions in the book. It is indeed a false design.
were the Ammonites in Whitby? A new suggestion was made by a doctor who worked in York. He was nicknamed the Spider-Man, but his real name was Martin Lister. And this drawing is from his book about spiders, the first English catalogue. He made a special study of ballooning spiders, which spin gossamer threads so they can travel through the air, sometimes for miles at a time. But he was also interested in the fossil ammonites. He wondered... Whether the stones we find in the forms of shellfish be naturally produced by some extraordinary plastic virtue latent in the earth or quarries in which they are found. As if God had planted them at the creation, and then they had grown. Lister is most famous for his massive four-volume book on shells. She sells she shells on the seashore. And these are some of the shells named after him. The shells were named after him. I'm sure. And these are two of the illustrations by his daughters, Anne and Susanna. The shells are drawn by Susanna and Anne. Illustrations by his daughters and bound in a book with their father's name. He encouraged them to draw and paint in watercolour when they were children, and later he taught them the skilled craft of making engravings. Quite a few scientific books were illustrated by women, and the Lister's engravings are technically extremely competent. And the Latin labels here had to be etched into the plates in mirror writing. Scientific books illustrated by women Engravings etched in mirror writing. They often place decorative borders or frames around their pictures as if to emphasise the beauty of nature. And from then on, interest in fossils and shells grew rapidly. She sells seashells on the seashore. The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure. For if she sells seashells on the seashore, then I'm sure she sells seashore shells. Seashore shells. A new canal network was being dug across England as labourers delved down into the earth, they revealed different geological layers. It was becoming clear that the earth was older than people had previously thought. So when the Scot James Hutton chipped at a rock face, he could see geological strata with different fossils buried at different depths. By around 1800, many people agreed with him that the earth was extremely old, although they generally still believed that God had created all the animals we see today. No new ones had evolved and no old ones had become extinct. Fossil hunting became extremely fashionable. For people living in London, Whitby was so far north that they preferred to hunt for fossils further south. And their favourite spot was Lyme Regis in Dorset. And that's where Mary Anning was born in 1799. And she grew up to be England's most famous fossil hunter. Like St Hilda, Mary Anning was associated with a miracle when she was 15 months old, three women were standing with her under a tree that was struck by lightning. The baby was the only one who survived, and although she had been weak and sickly, 
he began thriving and became unusually intelligent. So this is how Lyme Regis looked in the middle of the 19th century. Her father was a cabinet maker with very little money. So he taught his two surviving children, Mary and Joseph, how to hunt for fossils that could be sold to tourists as curios. Mary Anning spent much of her childhood hunting for fossils with her dog, Trey. Collectors were fascinated, but still had little idea of their true significance. Like an ancient Ammonite, the Earth's history swirls into the very distant past. Her discoveries helped to develop this concept of deep time, extending way back long before living creatures and human beings existed. The family's first big break came when her brother Joseph discovered this extraordinary head which mystified all the experts. The following year, Mary discovered the body and her mother sold the two pieces to a collector. This was the first complete skeleton to be found, but it didn't match any of the conventional classifications for living animals. Its Greek name, ichthyosaur, means fish lizard. It had no fins like a fish, no legs like a crocodile, but flippers rather like a dolphin's. From then on, Mary Anning's reputation grew and she became an expert at identifying as well as finding fossils. She became friendly with many London experts who came to stay in Leiden Regis. We sallied out in quest of Mary Anning, the geological lioness of the place. One of her visitors was William Buckland, an Oxford clergyman who astounded his students with his demonstrations. He had a reputation for eccentricity, kept hyenas in his back garden. He also boasted that he would eat anything and he was especially fond of mice on toast or roast panther. He served these unusual refreshments from his coffee table, only later informing his guests that the curious objects inlaid in its surface were coprolites, the scientific name for fossil faeces, which were also one of Mary Anning's great interests. But she also went on looking for bones and another of her great finds was this plesial skeleton, which seemed to be related to lizards. So this is her own sketch in a letter she sent trying to sell it, assuring her potential customer that... One thing I may venture to assure you, it is the first and only one discovered in Europe. It's now in a glass case in the Natural History Museum. So although she often received little credit at the time, here you can see her portrait firmly attributing the discovery to her. The mounted skeleton looks more complete than her original sketch. And that's because extracting skeletons from the rock they're embedded in is a very lengthy, skilled process. So these modern pictures give you an impression of how much hard physical labor Mary Anning had to perform out on the cliffs. And once back at home, she patiently brushed and chipped to reveal the outline of the bone. This was time consuming work and she found it hard to earn enough money. Her customers were wealthy, but she was desperately poor. So London geologist Henry de la Biche decided to help by selling this imaginary picture of a lake in ancient Dorset, swarming with creatures based on her discoveries. Ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs and pterodactyls, which nicknamed flying dragons. He made engravings that would be, could be copied and sold to raise money for supporting her. De La Biche was a wonderful illustrator, but he also enjoyed making fun of his colleagues. 
So here, Professor Ichthyosaurus is lecturing to some young reptilian students. And near his right flipper is a human skull. And he's telling his audience that no such creature could possibly ever have existed because its jaws weren't strong enough to crunch through all the food it needed. The real life professor was Charles Lyell, England's most famous geologist. In the frontispiece to his major book, Principles of Geology, he described these three pillars. The horizontal markings made by marine organisms indicate how over long, long periods of time, the columns have periodically been at different depths in the water. Lyle's books stretch back the age of the earth far, far further than anyone had ever done before. But as well as Anning, another unacknowledged woman lay concealed between its covers. Lyle's wife, Mary Horner, she spent her honeymoon learning geology in German, drew his illustrations, edited his texts, accompanied him on all his field trips and looked after his shell collection. She wrote to her sister, I have taught my maid Antonia to kill snails and clean out the shells and she is very expert. When Charles Darwin went on the Beagle for his round the world trip, he took Lyle's book with him. And during this voyage, he made his first sketchy notes about evolution. His revolutionary book on the origin of species appeared in 1859. Mary Anning had died in pain and poverty 12 years earlier, but her discoveries were crucial for proving that the universe is extremely ancient and that new species have appeared while others have become extinct. After her death, Mary Anning's glory dimmed, but unlike the mysterious fossils she found, her memory never completely faded away. In 1911, she was celebrated as St Georgina who slew the pterodactyl. And from then on, her fame grew. And she's now permanently commemorated in the Mary Anning wing of the Lyme Regis Museum. Oh yes, she is. But also very soon, this wonderful team of people will be unveiling a new statue. This is the maquette of it. Um, a bronze statue by, um, oh, now let me see. I wrote this down by, um, oh yes, Denise Dutton. Yes, it'll be unveiled on the shores of Lyme Regis next year on Anning's birthday, May the 21st. Yes. My goodness, that looks amazing. Who was responsible for that? Was it a couple of girls who were involved with this? Well, in fact, it was um, Evie, who's one of the, Evie and her mum, Anya. So <gasps> Evie was only 11 years old when she had the idea that it, absolutely Mary Anning should have a statue in Lyme Regis. And it's come on from there. So this will be an amazing end to a fabulous, fabulous campaign that they've undertaken. Oh, well, wow. yay, Evie and Anya, obviously, and uh, I can't wait to go and see it. And also the music that you're writing to celebrate this. Yeah, I know. But, you know, the statue itself is so important. There are so few statues for women, aren't there? And Absolutely. This yeah. is a fantastic addition. It's so good. Now, this statue that you're putting up, will there be lots of shells on it? Shells? Why would there be shells? Well, you know. She sells seashells on the seashore. Oh, I see. No, no, you see, that's, um, that, that's not, um. She sells seashells on the seashore. Oh, no, look, no, look what you've done. Now they've started she now. Well, yeah, because it's, it's yeah, with no, the shells. No, 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 she didn't sell seashells on the seashore. That's the point. She did, she did, didn't she? No, no. I thought, but the, um, the tongue twister was written for her, about her. Well, uh, no, no, come on. Um, this was a music hall song that was written in, I think it was 1908. And um, the guys that wrote it, well, I mean, they wouldn't have known that much about her anyway, because, you know, as um, Dr. Farrow just said, it was, what, 1911? Before that recognition came, you know, I, I, I don't think it was written about her. And, and anyway, she didn't sell seashells, did she? But, she? but she might have, mightn't she? She was on the beach. She might have sold some. 
Why is it with you and seashells? I think you're still thinking of Susanna and Anne Lister or something. She and might have a side pocket. She was desperately poor. She might have sold one or two. Look, look. She was an internationally recognised paleontologist who found fossils, fossils of ancient marine reptiles, who changed our understanding of time, who had contributed to Darwin's theory of evolution and sent specimens all over Europe and did our own study of coprolites, you see? Wait, wait, coprolites? What's that? <laughs> Dinosaur poo, of course. No, look, no, 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 this is not a no. She sells fossils on the seashore. The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure. Or if she sells seashells on the seashore, then I'm sure she sells Ammonites, that kind of thing. Okay. You know? okay. Look, now look, I'm no expert, okay? A definitely no expert. But look, I'm going to go and get an ice cream. I don't know about you. Oh, and good idea. Let's, let's, let's get Zoe, Zoe Hughes from the Natural History Museum. She's ah. an expert. Now, if anyone's going to know uh, what, uh, uh, if it had anything, anything at all to do with shells, she'll know. Thank you, Zoe. I'm going for an ice cream. Come on, Saman. Let's go. Fabulous. Hello, everybody. Okay, hopefully that has worked and everyone can see that. Cool. Brilliant. Okay, so hello. I am Zoe Hughes. I am the curator of brachiopods and cephalopods at the National at the Natural History Museum. Oh, I made a silly mistake there. Um, this evening, I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into the collection that I'm responsible for. Um, I'm going to focus on the cephalopod collection um, rather than the brachiopod collection. Um, because we're talking about ammonites today. Okay, right. So this obviously is the most the wonderful Natural History Museum. And this building on the end, this is the paleontology building attached to the beautiful Waterhouse building. Oh, I skimmed too much there. So welcome to the collections. This is what the collections in paleontology look like. Lots of big gray cabinets. Um, so I am responsible for about 9,000 drawers of, of specimens. I have been in my role about eight years, which has flown by. Seems bizarre that it's been that long. Um, so of those 9,000 drawers, about half of those are brachiopods and the other half are cephalopods. So if we look inside those cabinets, we've got a lot of drawers, some racking and some specimens on shelves. So the collection comprises mainly of ammonites, so the ammonoidia. However, there are also some nautiloidia and some coleoidia, but we will come to those in a little bit. Um, yeah, so ammonites have a long and varied fossil history. This group has been around about 400 million years, and they are much more common in the fossil record than the nautiloids, which is why, despite the nautiloids actually having been around a bit longer, we've got more ammonites in the collection than nautiloids. Um, Yes, so the, this is probably because um, ammonites were more common than nautiloids in the ancient oceans. Okay, so both of these, because they've got hard chambered shells, fossilise exceptionally well. Um, obviously hard parts do fossilise. Think about what fossils fossilises. Um, the hard parts tend to fossilise much better, so bones and shells and teeth and things. Um, soft tissue preservation in ammonites is possible. However, we've never found anything to prove the theories of the arm reconstructions that you see quite commonly. Um, we found little bits of muscle tissue inside the body chamber. Um, so these arm reconstructions are based about what we know about their closest rel relatives, the coleoids. So that's all of the octopuses, cuttlefish, squid, um, animals like these. Um, also the belemnites. Now belemnites are very common fossils. Uh, this is what you tend to find. This isn't the whole animal. This is a tiny part. 
that's an internal part of the animal. We don't really know what it's for. It actually attaches to the chambered shell inside. Um, it might be a counterweight, we don't know, but these had a very squid-like body. And if you look here, this Belemnotuthis antiquus is one of the relatives. This is amazing soft tissue, re uh, soft tissue preservation, getting my words all muddled, um, showing, well, it's basically showing the whole animal, including the ink sac, and those are amazing. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to the collections. So returning to St Hilda and the Ammonites, this is a stained glass window from a church in Whitby, and you can see that there are Ammonites in the window. These also form part of the coat of arms of Whitby. So the Ammonites are really important in Whitby. So this is the Hildoceros bifron carved into a snake stone. This is a specimen found in the NHM's collections. So I am responsible for this. We also have snake stones carved into another type of ammonite, um, but the Hildoceros is the more proper one. And this is the ammonite whose genus is named after St. Hilda. Okay, taking you through some of my favorite things in the collection now. Okay, so this is a beautiful specimen. I realize there's no scale. It's about this big. So probably about 30 centimeters, maybe, not quite. Um, it is a Placentisaurus, and this is found in Canada. There are two beds where you get this amazing preservation. So it's not the standard aragonite shell. It's aragonite has actually been formed into, um, through other processes, formed into this beautiful mineral called amylite. So there are two beds where you can find this, one where you find whole ammonites and another where you just found fragments. And those fragments are often made into really beautiful jewelry because it is a gemstone. Okay, this is one of my absolute favorite specimens. Um, also, I get a lot of visitors um, to the collections who always ask, I think jokingly, can I have this specimen for my headstone? <laughs> to which I say, no, that's not what museum collections are for. Um, so this is amazing. This is an example of something called Master Magna Marble. And this is from not too far from Lyme Regis. Um, so it's also similarly Jurassic. What's interesting is it's potentially a death assemblage, or it is a death assemblage, and it's packed full of ammonites. There are two species. So the larger ones are called Xiphosaurus, and the smaller ones are called Promicrocerus. Now, this specimen's unusual because most other specimens of Marston Magna Marble have much higher percentage of the little ammonites and the, only the occasional one of those big ammonites. So this is quite an unusual specimen, but it is absolutely beautiful. And if you visit the NHM, you can see this on display in our galleries. Um, also, we don't know why anyone carved this out of this beautiful, beautiful stone. We have no idea. Okay. Okay, so cephalopods all have a chambered shell at some point in their evolutionary history. Looking at ammonites or the ammonoidia, we have three major, three different types of sutra. And essentially it changes and gets more complicated as time goes on. Now, my predecessor, Frank Spath, painted between these sutra lines and the sutra lines mark the edges of the chambers of the shell. So in the Goniotitic Sutra, you see it's very simple. This is the one on the left. Um, so that is a goniotite, and those are the earliest ammonoidia. And then the Ceratitic, which they were around in the Triassic. Um, this one has slightly more complicated sutras. This lovely Ceratite, but not as complicated as the later ones. So these are the true ammonites with ammonitic sutras. They have lots and lots of very elaborate designs in those sutras. Again, we don't know why they got more complicated as time goes on. We have no idea, but these chambers allowed the, spec allowed the ammonites to control their buoyancy in the ocean and control their position as Nautilus does today. Okay. Nautiloids aren't all round and spirally. So here we have some just a couple of examples um, of heteromorphic ammonites. 
Um, this means that they don't follow the same standard spiral. They go a bit mad, really. Um, so at the top left, we have Nicomites. This is my favorite one because I don't know how this ammonite would have lived. It's a marvelous mystery to me. Um, these are found in Japan, as the name might suggest. And they didn't survive for that long. So these are actually exceptionally rare. So this specimen pictured is actually a cast. We don't have a real one at the Natural History Museum. And then coming a little bit closer to home, this is a lower Cretaceous ammonite called a Hamites. And this one looks a bit like a hook. And these you can find in the Folkestone region. Okay, um, so we get a lot of different types of preservation in ammonites. Sometimes we just get molds of the inside, the shell dissolves away. Sometimes we get infills like with this Oxynotisserus. And this has been infilled by beautiful calcite. Um, it's green and it's the most beautiful specimen. This is a, pyrit a pyritic specimen um, and it is absolutely stunning. It has no shell left, so this is all fossilized. Oh, no, it does. Sorry, I'm lying. <laughs> okay, so this is another example of a different type of preservation. So this is where compression has happened. So this is Siloceros um, from Watch It, as you can see on the specimen. And this is another really important specimen. It's from the William Smith collection. And he was famous for creating his map of the geology of the UK around the time that people were going and digging up all of those canals. Now, this is the original aragonitic shell preserved and compressed onto the rock. And it's beautiful. It's a very beautiful specimen. Okay, I cannot show you things from the collection without showing you this. This is one of the superstar specimens. So this is a fossilized octopus. It's called Coipia species. It's a Coipia. Um, it might be a new species. Um, and basically it's got phosphatized preservation. So the actual soft tissue of the octopus has been turned to stone. And you can see, hang on, where's my mouse? There we go. So you can see you've got the arms that's right, octopuses have arms, not tentacles. They have no tentacles. And you can see the impression of the suckers. And over here, these little blobs are the eyes. Amazing, but it gets more amazing. If you shine a UV light on the octopus, that phosphatized tissue lights up. And so you can see even clearer how big and sort of the shape and the morphology of the specimen. So I think we can see that, or some of these fossilized animals that Mary Anning found, she does, did find some specimens in my collection, a fossilized squid, like animal. Um, so I think you can see that she may not have been selling seashells, but she was selling fossil sea animals. So thank you very much. Have a brief introduction to the collection that I'm responsible for. Thank you, Zoe. So she might have been selling seashells. Yes, she may well have been. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> Samantha won again. <laughs> I did, I did. Thank you so much, Zoe and everybody for a, a fabulous evening's uh, performance. And if people do have any questions, please, uh, please feel free to either type something into the chat or to raise your hand uh, and uh, we'll endeavour to answer them. Um, I should highlight at this point, we, we have as part of the Yorkshire Fossil Festival, uh, a, a screening at eight o'clock of the film Ammonite, which is inspired by Mary Annie. I think Francis Lee, the director, says it's not meant to be a biopic, but it is a, a, a film that Mary Annie is, is the pivotal character. So uh, yes, I shall be heading across Scarborough to, to take part in, in that. Um, but yes, if you have any, anything you would like to ask, uh, feel, feel free. <laughs> okay, sorry. I've just noticed in, in the chat, I got a question that was addressed just to me that nobody else could see, which said, uh, can you please show us the, the rotunda plesiosaur? So I'm in the rotunda museum 
in Scarborough. And we have a plesiosaur, which is, as was mentioned earlier, is a, a fossil that was essentially discovered by Mary Anning. Um, I should point out this one in Scarborough is not one that was discovered by Mary Anning. It's a, it's a local one, it was found 20 years ago. Uh, but yes, sadly, I can't get up to the gallery to, to show you. So um, you'll have to uh, look, look on our social media. There's definitely pictures of the plesiosaur on social media. Can I ask you a question, Zoe? Um, I, can I ask if if you you the octopus? I, I thought that was absolutely amazing that fossil. That fossil. You you mentioned that it, you know that that you don't have very many of them. Is that is that the case all over the world? I mean, I know that soft tissue is very unusual to have it fossilized, and it's just it seems like such an amazing thing. I've never seen anything like it. So, yeah, it is absolutely amazing. So I forgot to say. Of the 9,000 drawers of specimens that I look after, the 4,500 was to the Kephlopod collection. Um, so hundreds of thousands, if not millions of specimens, four in the collection are octopuses. Um, I can't estimate because I don't know for certain how many they are, there are, but essentially there is globally one from near Chicago, from I think it's the Carboniferous, one from the Jurassic, from France, that's Proto Octopus, which is the most beautiful specimen. I would like to go see that in real life. And then all of the rest of the known fossil octopuses are from Lebanon. They're all Cretaceous, they're all about 95 million years old, and there was something amazing happening. So, to get that preservation, you need an anoxic environment and sudden, heavy, sci fine sediment falling. So, there's no predators, and suddenly everything is covered. And it also needs to be quite acidic. <laughs> So it's very special circumstances that allows that preservation. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Oh, I wonder, is, it, is Noah age seven? Do you want to ask that question yourself? Oh, or we've, do you want we've, us to we've temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's a question in the chat from, from Noah age seven who asks, do we know what ammonites ate? Um, We've never found evidence, but we can assume that they would have been scavenging things. So smaller bits of algae. Um, it depends on the size of them. So some ammonites are very, very small and some ammonites are very, very big, like two meters across. So the bigger ones were probably eating things like fish, other mollusks, potentially smaller ammonites. Um, and the little ones would have been eating microscopic plankton and things. Mm -hmm. And then following seamlessly on, Bella, age nine, asks, do we know what plesiosaurs ate? Plesiosaurs would have probably been eating ammonites, other mollusks, fish and things. Yes, yeah, so, so, so yes, yeah, sadly, with the answer, <laughs> what plesiosaurs ate the previous question. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> They're the next step up in the uh, food chain. <laughs> so, so, so can I ask you a question? The, the picture that I showed that Henry de la Biche painted and then engraved to raise money for Mary Anning, it showed pterodactyls, plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. And that was, I think it was 1830, 1840, something like that, that he drew that picture. How, ac do, how accurate do modern paleontologists think that that representation was? Or ha have ideas changed quite dramatically since the Victorian times. Would it be possible to see that image again? Could you share your screen and share that image with everybody so everyone can see and also so I can have a little look because I forgot. Well, I can have a go. <laughs> I can have a go. Uh, I have no, absolutely no guarantee. Well, while she's doing that, Noah's got yep. another question. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. No, I'm just going well, to go backwards. You've seen that one. Cool. Going to go backwards. Oh, okay. Oh, there. There we go. Okay, that one. Well, it's not too bad actually. Well, hmm. So I'm not a marine reptile expert, but the ichthyosaur with its that's biting. I mean, there's too many animals in the sea. It's a so, bit too. Um, so this is the this is the ichthyosaur. Yeah. This, the is ichth the this is the plesiosaur, and these are the pterodactyls flapping around in the sky. I mean, the pterodactyls, they're a bit hard to see. Mm, I don't know. It's, it's better than some. 
but it still has some issues. The neck of the plesiosaur is a bit wibbly. <laughs> It's, not it's, too been bad. it's been chewed by the ichthyosaur, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and are pterodactyls, are they birds or dinosaurs or what are they? They are reptiles, they are not <laughs> dinosaurs. So all dinosaurs are reptiles, but not all reptiles are dinosaurs. Got it. So that, that's how to upset uh, pterosaur workers, by telling them that pterodactyls and pterosaurs are flying dinosaurs and the way to upset the marine reptile workers is to claim that ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs are swimming dinosaurs <laughs> just if anyone wants to go out and upset people i'm, I'm not encouraging it okay, it's, just, it's not really my goal to go out and offend them no it's it 1830s. Really. It's got, i've got the date on the slide it was 1830s so i mean it's a long while ago it's 200 years ago that this picture was made yeah it's not too bad i don't know too much about marine reptiles but they don't look too bad the sclerotized eye of the ichthyosaur I don't think is quite right but I've seen worse <laughs> well there's an ammonite is that an ammonite down in that box? yeah I think that's an ammonite yeah it looks like a dead one there's no ammonite in it <laughs> it's been eaten yes so I think we've just got time for one more question uh no we've got two Noah Ooh. Noah wanted to ask what's the most common type of ammonite that depends where you are so there are about i think oh hang on i think there's about thirty thousand species of ammonite and they were around for such a long period of time that sometimes it depends where you are and i don't know because you had different ammonites in different places and then some of them lasted a longer period of time. Ooh, I might throw it out and say possibly a Lytoceros. They had quite a long period of time, but I have no idea to be perfectly honest. <laughs> so, and Bella's got one last question, wants to know what is your favorite dinosaur or prehistoric reptile or prehistoric sea creature? She's covering all bases there. So, I, 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 so are you asking Zoe that, Bella? Yeah, she's not. She doesn't want to be to say hello now. Okay. We could all say what well, our favourite is. <laughs> Mine changes because I look after so many different amazing animals. It really does change based on what I'm working on or what I'm doing at the time. So, oh, that's really hard. Although I think I'm going to swing it completely randomly and say a glyptodon. <laughs> I'm oh, quite goodness. fond of a glyptodon. All right. Um, well, I have, mine has to be a plesiosaur because of, because I'm so in awe of Mary Anning. Just got to be that. So my favourite has to be Professor Rick Theosaurus because I didn't have time to talk about that picture a lot, but he's got some glasses perched on his snout and the, one of the points was that Charles Lyell uh, was very myopic. He really couldn't see very well at all. And so his wife, Mary Horner, had to do all his reading for him. That was partly why she looked after all his shells. So, so I, th I think that was an absolutely brilliant inspiration on de la Biche's part to prop these, these, these little glasses on the ich ichthyosaur's nose. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. Well, um, we've, we've come to the end of our time because uh, we, 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 we have to go and we know that uh, people are waiting. We just wanted to say thank you very much uh, for coming.